Firstly, welcome to the fireside chat. This is the best that we could do in terms of actually making a fireside chat. Um, so it was going to be in the small room back there, but I don't know if people notice that every session, oh, thank you, every session uh, was absolutely jam-packed upstairs, so I'm really pleased for us to be in here. It was meant to be more intimate. One of the things that when we did RightsCon the first time, people said is like, make the spaces more intimate. So this is counter to that, but anyway, great that there are so many people here. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that a lot of people have been asking about the RightsCon party. Uh, that got your attention. <laughs> uh, so the RightsCon party is tomorrow night. Uh, it starts after the, uh, the cocktail event, which is in the atrium down there at 8. And there will be buses from here to the party. So uh, without any further ado, um, um, we have a really extraordinary panel here. I think we're, we're very privileged to be uh, sitting, or I feel very privileged to be sitting here um, amongst this group who, as I said in the opening session, you know, many of us live our lives on these platforms, uh, or much of our lives on these platforms, and I think we're just at the very beginning of the technology revolution. I don't know how many people have seen her, uh, but, you know, it sort of gives you an indication of what's to come. This is the very start of the, of the technology revolution. So if this is just an indication, then these people who are sitting next to me are ex and their companies are extraordinarily powerful. Um, and um, I might just actually get you guys to introduce yourselves just quickly rather than me introduce you because I'm sure you can do it better than I can. So, Russ. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Ross Lajeunesse and I lead the team at Google that works on free expression, open internet, trade and international policy, including internet governance, which I know is one of the topics that we'll want to dive into today. Hi, my name is Joe Sullivan, and I manage the uh, security team at Facebook. And I'm Del Harvey, pinch hitting from Twitter in place of Tumblr. They both started with T, so it made sense. <laughs> and I head up trust and safety for Twitter, which is everything from law enforcement requests to intellectual property to these sorts of issues. Um, so this is meant to be a super interactive conversation. It's a fireside chat. Anybody is welcome to ask a question um, and to make also a comment. We've got the Slido uh, uh, functionality, which means that people can uh, put their questions up on the screen up there and we can talk to that. Or there should be some microphones uh, roving, or people can just come and grab a microphone from me. But please. You know, I don't intend to ask all of the questions here. Also, you three should feel free to talk to each other. It doesn't need to come through me. Disagree with each other, agree with each other. Um, I actually wanted to start off with the, with the uh, question about the, the Dalai Lama. Uh, ha have you got anyone here met the Dalai Lama? Russ, yes. Anyone in the room? Awesome. Tell us what happened. Uh, I, I haven't met the Dalai Lama while I was at Google. I was working in Washington on the Hill for a guy by the name of George Mitchell, who was the majority leader of the Senate, and the Dalai Lama came to visit, and so I had an opportunity to meet with him. It was pretty fantastic. So the reason why I asked that is because recently the Dalai Lama um, was in the Bay Area, actually this week, last week, and he said, even business needs a sense of ethics. He, he appeared to be asking for more compassion from the valley. And I'd be interested to hear what, what you think about that. Do you want me to answer because I've met him? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, think, uh, I think businesses that are successful in today's world do have a sense of ethics. Uh, I don't think that it's, at least at Google, it's not treated as an issue separate and apart from everything else that we consider as we go about how we run the company. I think. At Google, there's this real drive uh, that if, if you put the user first, everything else is going to follow. And when you think about what the user wants, you think about it from the perspective of providing the services and the products that users want, but you also think about it in, in the sense of providing the experience and the interaction that the user wants. The user wants to feel that his or her um, data is secure. The user wants to feel and know that his or her data, you know, that you're going to maintain this sense of privacy about that, about that user. And the user wants to feel like the companies and the services that they're interacting with are doing the right thing. 
So we see it as part of everything else that we do rather than a sort of separate, oh, we've got this CSR component, we've got to you know, tick some boxes on there. It's, it's very integrated into what we were all about as a company. I mean, it's interesting that you say that, that successful companies are the ethical ones. I mean, it's not that they're successful because they're unethical. And I think that's increasingly what we're seeing is that now privacy, for instance, is actually a determinant in the, the, the amount of customers that a company has. And maybe turn to, to Dell on, on that. I mean, you might like to reflect on the Dalai Lama as well, but just this issue about you know, trust with the user and how important is that actually to the business model? So as the most public of the three platforms, we're probably the one that has the least information generally on our users and users have the lowest expectation of people not seeing their tweets. People usually want other people to see their tweets in terms of uh, usability. We obviously still have a lot of the same concerns and beliefs around the importance of users having an understanding of what information they're sharing and how it's being shared and then control over how that information is being shared. And not just understanding like they clicked a, a little box that said, yes, I understand, because that happens pretty rapidly, but a meaningful understanding where they understand what the potential ramifications of this sharing can be. And I think that for a lot of companies, it's challenging to balance what users expect and how users then behave in terms of, you know, well, users expect it to work a certain way. They may not be, ex the company may not expect that to be the way it's used. So there's a lot, I think, of work that we as companies do on a regular basis to try to understand how our platforms are being used in ways that we weren't anticipating and then building protections for that as well. And I think that's really important. Yeah. That's a, let me jump, jump in. Uh, that's a great point, Del. Um, yes. I really vividly <laughs> remember. Done for the fireside. <laughs> Go on. I really remember uh, coming to this event in 2011, and we've talked since then about the thing that left the, the lasting impression for me was uh, we had uh, a lot of different hallway meetings and conversations with activists from around the world who told me stories about how they had used Facebook in ways that I had never even thought of. Um, because um, we're sitting here in California building a product and they were facing specific experiences that they needed to work around that weren't the base uh, when we were thinking of the product, they weren't the base use of the product. Yeah. And, and I took so much out of that experience, and, and that was the primary reason I was excited to come back again, was to hear how are people evolving in their use of, of, of all of our products. And, yeah. and, and sometimes they're using them way ahead of the way we, we are thinking about them, and what can we learn from them? So um, this morning I shared an Uber uh, here, with a gentleman from Uganda, um, not Richard, the one who I mentioned before, but a different fellow. Uh, and he was saying that there's a new um, law that's been passed in Uganda, which is called the miniskirt law, which is essentially a law that um, um, criminalizes the use of porn. Uh, I mean, not like just porn altogether. And people can be, you know, like, the, the police can come to you and raid you. And he was saying that, in fact, that the internet and, 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 and the, the Facebook platform is kind of almost like the last refuge for them to be able to communicate with each other about the issues that they need to. Of course, the issue of porn is just, it's a sideshow. It's like they're setting up the infrastructure and the framework to be able to control content. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that all over the world, there are people who are using the platforms, Facebook and Twitter and Google, to be able to exercise their rights in a way that the platforms were necess not necessarily designed for. Coming back to this issue about ethics, I wonder whether you, you think that companies actually have an obligation to ensure the digital rights of their users, not just because it's good for business or because it's about what they hear from users, but do you think that there is an obligation? And if you do think that there is an obligation, then 
how could that how should or could that obligation be enforced because actually what we're talking about companies that are largely beyond the role of the state generally the state has been responsible for having the obligation should the company have an obligation and does it i mean I think that any time you start getting into obligation, you start wondering who enforces that obligation and what that looks like, along with you know which digital rights in particular. But that being said, I think it's actually really important for companies to have a philosophy around these sorts of issues that is separate from whatever is potentially, you know, okay, well, here's the mandatory minimum required by law. Having a philosophy around concepts like, you know, it's important to defend and respect the user's voice. It's important that users have a way of appealing if there's an issue. It's important that users have a form of recourse. I think that, I think that we probably do have an obligation, not in terms of any sort of, you know, legal requirement, but in terms of just being good corporate citizens and in terms of giving our users a reason to trust us. We need to, you know, do what we can to protect them. The, the problem that I have with that is that, and I understand we don't want a regulated internet, but the problem that I have with that is that, and I, I know you, Dell, for a couple of years now, we're almost reliant upon the person who is in that position of trust and safety at Twitter having this philosophy. If the company had employed somebody else, you have so much leverage in determining which data gets sent to a government or uh, security authority, which go, who goes to law enforcement to decide if something is real or illegitimate. That kind of flexibility, that lack of norms, that lack of legislative, perhaps, environment, puts the obligation or the duty onto the company. And that potentially is a question of personality. I, I mean, to some degree, and I, I think both of these guys can probably speak to it as well, but there's actually a lot of industry discussion around a lot of these concepts. You know, how do you handle these sorts of requests? How do you handle issues related to broader topics? There's, there's a lot of common conversations, and maybe it's not to the point where we've said, okay, let's, you know, introduce some regulation, but we've agreed to different frameworks in other countries, for example, around complaint handling processes, and we're on some of these task forces. I mean, I think there is actually maybe some preliminary stuff that's already done. Yeah, I, I spend most of my time in the world of technical security, and um, we would fail if we, if we worked in a vacuum by ourselves, if we didn't open ourselves up to dialogue about what's the right approach. Um, and when, when I've seen regulation that's tried to prescribe how uh, security should be done, well, I, let's say I've seen it tried many times, I've never seen it work. Um, the technical, so if, if, if you write legislation on what's the right technical things to do for right now to pr protect a particular type of information, in three years that legis the legislation would be forcing you to do less let, secure Let me things. jump in there actually to a so, question sure. which is behind you, which is in the wake of the Snowden revelations, do you think that the obligations owed to users by internet companies have, has changed? How or in the, in the alternative, why not? So if we're thinking about, and as you say, like it does become a bigger a question, um, you know, the sort of environment changes, so the regulation would need to be adaptive and continuously updated. We've seen a major development that's happened with the Snowden revelations. How, does it, how do you think it has shifted that obligation or shifted the relationship? I've seen a shifting in the relationship, um, in primarily in that we now have more permission to talk about things, uh, partially because we've all fought for it, and partially because there's a lot more interest. Um, partially you need to have, if, if we wanted to talk about encryption, encryption standards a couple of years ago. There weren't a lot of reporters who wanted to talk about it with us. Um, and now there are many more. So um, if there's any silver lining on, on the Snowden uh, situation, it is that there's a lot more attention on this, just uh, both like the front end uh, lawful uh, requests or quote unquote lawful requests and then also the technology side of it. Um, I, I think it, I could say that all of our companies haven't fundamentally changed any of our practices in, in either of those areas, but we've, with, and, but we've faced a lot of scrutiny, 
and probably all three of us feel really good about the practices we had in place before the attention came on because we're generally speaking all still following the same practice. Let's hear from Ross and then we'll jump to the, well, to I was, the audience. I was going to say that I don't think the obligations have changed. The, the dialogue has certainly changed and, and the nature of the relationships uh, with our user has changed in the sense that um, there's a debate going on right now that, um, as Joe was mentioning, you know, there are certain things we weren't even permitted to talk about. You know, the receipt of national security letters, for example. And now there's a debate and a dialogue going on among our users, government, and companies that needs to happen. Um, and, the, and the debate and is, is a good thing, and I think we're starting to see it, it move uh, government practices in, in the right direction. I agree that sort of our practices and the obligations that we felt to our users have been fairly constant, which is to keep that data secure, keep it safe, um, and, uh, and it's really the government that um, I think is sort of changing its approach. So let's hear from the audience. Anyone have a question? This is your chance. Yeah, if we can get a runner with a microphone, that would be great. Could you introduce yourself as well? Uh, my name is Orvi Negrani. I currently work for Oximity, but I've done a variety of media jobs in the past. Um, the question I have is specifically geared towards Google because um, regarding user privacy and also accountability, um, my only experience attempting to document Google was when Consumer Watchdog had a protest outside of your Mountain View office. And I've traveled through Central Asia. I've gone through Russia and Ukraine. I've never had anybody physically put a hand in front of my camera until I tried to photograph a protest outside of the Google headquarters. And my question is, if you're not necessarily accountable to media here, and if your PR has enough support to like block questions in this area, how can we trust that you're actually going to be accountable when you're giving us your privacy reports and other documents that we're supposed to take on face value? Well, I would say, first of all, that I'm sorry you had that experience at our campus that is far from the norm, um, and I apologize for that. But I think it's dangerous to take that example and extrapolate it out and say, therefore, Google doesn't care about privacy or is not accountable, because I believe that we are, and we certainly try to be, both to the media and to our users. Um, Right. Um, well, first of all, I hope you believe me and that I'm not trying to, you know, sell you a seaside house in Nebraska or something like that. But I think that there are, you know, we do more than just talk about it. I think you um, should look at the way we conduct our business and the way that we interact with government, the work that we're doing, you know, to reform the surveillance sort of apparatus, the work that we've done on transparency since 2010. Um, I think that our actions at Google speak a lot more loudly and more clearly than, than our words do. And, and hopefully, um, again, it's, you know, the, the unfortunate experience that you had at campus is not, I feel, representative of who we are as a company and what we believe in or the work that we do. Let's, let's move on. And if it's okay, perhaps you guys can talk more because I don't think that you're totally satisfied with that answer. But perhaps you guys can talk uh, afterwards, you know, bilateral, uh, but, but you raised the issue, and I think you also raised it, of transparency and transparency reporting, and we're, we're kind of now seeing, um, you know, a trend within the technology sector for companies to report on and to push for what they can report on as well, but to report on the use of the requests from governments for user data, how many they complied with. Um, what sort of reporting would satisfy you like? Do you think that you're now in a position where you are able to report uh, as much as you'd like to? No. Okay. No. No. Okay. Excellent. So the next question is: What are you not allowed to report on that you would like to tell us about? Well, you know, we're looking for a lot more granularity. We'd like to be able to 
report on the actual number of government requests rather than the, the range that we're now allowed to do. But I mean, that's progress. But I mean, before we couldn't even acknowledge that these things were going on. So it's progress, but I'd like to see us be able to report on the actual number. I'd like to be able to report on the types of requests that we're getting, whether it's Section 215 of the Patriot Act or 702, you know, and also the specific number of user accounts that are affected. And those are all things that we can't currently do. And add in the nationality of the people. Okay. And, and Dale, from you? I mean, I would, I would echo what they've said. I think in particular, really, the, at least right now, the, the swath that we would theoretically be allowed to report in, even if, even if there were an argument to be made against saying, okay, report the actual, like the exact number, even if there was an argument to be made about that, the ranges that are currently proscribed are so broad as to be meaningless for the vast majority of companies that would ever receive or could receive these sorts of, of orders or, and we'd also like to be able to report on what we have not received any of, you know, sort of not just here's the exact numbers on what we've received, but also, and we have not received any blank. So, so Trent, I know, I I mean, we're focusing on one specific subset, which are, you know, the, the national security letters. And, and you started off by saying that there is this uh, pretty marked trend toward transparency. And that's, that's not something we should just sort of gloss over. I mean, we're seeing company after company produce transparency reports. Um, and that's, that's, that's great information for people to have. I mean, and every time that we release our transparency report, we're very focused on making it more granular more informative, you know, we list out country by country the number of requests we get, uh, how many of those uh, we comply with, um, and I think that's, you know, that's a fantastic thing and we're starting to see the telcos do the same thing and we're all sort of moving in the, in the right direction. No, I mean, I have to say, we've spent a lot, a lot of time at Access on questions of transparency, which to my mind is actually, in, it's a, a good but insufficient response. Like, we want to see change in practice. We don't just want to see more information about bad practice. Yeah, right? I totally agree with you. And, um, but and you can't have that conversation about what is good and bad practice when you, you don't even know the information. So it's a necessary first step, yeah. but, not, but not by no means the yeah. solution. And, and great also, and I think a number of the telcos are potentially in the room who have also started to issue transparency reports. Two years ago, I went to the annual general meeting of um, Vodafone and I asked the chairman in front of a room of 2,000 shareholders whether... Um, they would issue a transparency report. And it was almost heresy. And, and then the whole, you know, I don't take single-handed responsibility for it, but um, there was the person who asked the question after me was asking why the font in the annual report was so small. Uh, but, 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 but regardless... Transparency in all things. You couldn't read it. <laughs> but, I mean, I think this question of transparency is absolutely important, a great trend. But again, like, you know, we really do need to see some wholesale practice change, and I want to get to that. Um, I see some hands in the audience, uh, Andrew McLaughlin, Tim Carr. I've got one. So, um, so the, like one of the fundamental problems here for the companies is that your physical infrastructures span many different countries. You hold data in multiple jurisdictions. Those jurisdictions often don't exercise restraint when it comes to asking for data about users. If you could be sure that the U.S. would only ask about U.S. data and uh, U.S. citizens' data or U.S. residents' data, the British would ask the same, the Brazilians would exercise restraint. One of the fears that people have about multinational internet companies now is that uh, well outside any of the constitutional or legal protections that they may have for their own data from their own government, um, other governments may get access to it because they use your services. Can you comment on that and how you think about um, encouraging or promoting or pushing self-restraint by governments, whether it's even possible? Well, I think um, one of the big questions around transparency is not just the, the, the question of being transparent about the number of requests. Um, ideally, we'd have a world where governments are transparent about the number of accounts that they're collecting information on, regardless of how they did it. Uh, because as we've seen from, I think, kind of like the second half of the stories, uh, governments are, have been quite aggressive using technology to, to not just serve legal process, but to access information um, otherwise. 
uh, and you know, for all of us, that's really disconcerting. Uh, uh, and so, uh, if we could turn it around that way and talk about um, transparency in terms of, of accessing accounts, and then second of all, we'd love to see that not just from the United States government, but from many other governments as well. Tim Carr with Free Press. Uh, have, have any of your companies had serious conversations about moving your business models slowly away from big data? Uh, I mean, I think this is a, will be a perennial problem as long as your businesses are built on aggregating data in this way. Is, are there serious discussions? I don't, I mean, you don't need to give any way, away any corporate secrets, but uh, are there serious discussions about a future where big data doesn't drive the business model of your, your companies? Yeah, I, I think we all, uh, I mean, speaking from, from a security perspective, I, I, we, are, uh, we try to be very thoughtful about the data that we retain because we have a responsibility to retain it in, with, it, with due care. And so uh, I, I went through an experience a couple of years ago when we um, chose to set up our uh, international infrastructure in the EU. So most of the people who use Facebook are um, interacting with our European entity and so we're subject to European privacy law uh, through that. And one of the principles there, of course, is that you, you don't retain information unless you need it for purposes of the service. Uh, I'm probably getting the legal phrasing a little bit wrong because I haven't focused on that side in a long time. But uh, we went through a, a process with um, the data protection authorities where they looked at what, is, what, what data do you have and what, why do you have that piece of data and how is it used um, one of the things that that led to was a, um, a, we have a, a part of your profile where you can look at um, what we call your activity log and so that you can see everything that's there and choose to delete it, et cetera. Uh, and, and so through that process, we became more transparent about what data we were um, in a custodian of. And it also ma made us think about every, and every time we launch a new product, what data would be collected, why do we need it? And I think you want to have that discipline. Uh, can I just uh, a follow-up question on that? I mean, I think what Tim uh, is saying is that if the companies weren't collecting that data, then surveillance, mass surveillance, would be very difficult for the governments to undertake. And so the question is, if you really are concerned about surveillance, is not the quick-fire answer which has economic consequences, of course, but you know, to, to actually collect less, or even not to collect, or... Right. So, I mean, there's one, uh, I, I see one flaw in that premise in that, uh, for the most part, law enforcement requests are not asking for anything other, in, in the case of Facebook, the vast majority of law enforcement requests are saying, who's the person behind that account? So it's, it's not, um, even getting into communications or anything like that? I mean, for us, we just were in such a different place, I guess, that it would be hard for me to contribute too meaningfully uh, and that, you know, we don't have a real name policy. We don't collect as much granular information about users, but, you know, kind of, again, hearkening back to users having a meaningful understanding of what information they're sharing, one of the things that we added relatively early on to your settings page is the ability to delete all the geotags that you've posted on your account. So for example, had you been geotagging stuff because you wanted people to know where you were and you know, you'd, deliver, you'd opted into doing it and you'd said again, yes, I wanna geotag this tweet. If you then decided later, oh, I actually don't wanna do that, we've made it so that you can go and click a button and that'll be deleted, but the tweets won't be, right? Like it's. I, I think that we all try to be mindful of both what we have and then also how we can let users tell us, no, don't take that, right? Whether it be, you know, opting out of, of tracking or removing geotagging and then also letting users understand, you know, this is what we are using it for. I think that's a really major thing, you know? But I'm in a slightly 
my company is in a slightly different position. So no, but it's it's much the same for us. I think the approach that we the, the approach that we've taken is that uh, this data actually makes our services better and work it work better for our users. And so our approach has been to give the user control over the data that is collected. We have a privacy dashboard where he or she can just sort of wipe it clean. Data liberation front where they can export it very easily and just leave us all together. There's always the option to use our services um, not signed in as an unsigned in user. So that sort of control and then transparency about what we do know about him or her is the approach that we've taken. Because we found that users don't enjoy our services as, as much when, when that isn't happening. So, Are we sharing a mic? Yeah, well, I think we're sharing a mic. Um, so we have two questions, one here, and then we'll just follow up with you, and then we'll get a response from the panel. Could you introduce yourself as well? Can we get some audio on the mic? Is it working? There, okay, thanks, hi. My name's Kalia, my handle online is Identity Woman, and I'm an independent advocate for the rights and dignity of our digital selves, and I, like many people, several summers ago, had our Google account suspended because we refused to send in our passport to verify who we were because our name wasn't name-shaped. And, uh, and I think, you know, we can talk all we want about privacy, but if we don't actually give users the choice to define their own names online, to separate their professional lives from their activist lives, from their sex lives. And the only way you do that is by using different names with different email addresses in different contexts, because otherwise it's all linked together. Um, you know, how are those sort of practical rights embedded within your system's functionality going to be maintained in the future? Because if you can, you know, and Facebook also has this tattle on your friends if they're not using their real names. And I really appreciate Twitter's not going this direction and sort of leaving verified. If you want to get verified and you're like super famous, like you can come to us and we'll help you out. I'm still not verified. What I do know, I got to do here? I know. So, but like how, how going ahead are you actually, you know, all those folks in third world countries they can still speak and dissent, but not give away their identities, but not if you guys keep pressuring people to use their real names all the time for everything they do online. So how are you gonna like, maintain our freedoms in the way your systems work, not just on how much you tell the government when they knock on your door? Thanks a lot. Can you pass the mic over to the lady behind you? And... Uh, uh, Marie-Georges, French and uh, on behalf of the Council of Europe. Uh, I, I am surprised that you say so much that you, you are very much uh, aware and that you want to, to keep uh, the privacy of your users and everything. I'm very, very surprised that if you see, because each time one service comes up, a new one, each time there is a problem. So, I don't know, maybe you, you would need to be trained a little bit uh, about the principles that U.S. formulated first in the 70s, which are still very pertinent. But this is another story. About the report, uh, the transparency. Um, I think that the, the case of France, well, it's true that we have a, a small, uh, not... Uh, legal system, not, not as big as the US, of course. And this is our problem, that we have to, to deal and to regulate it. But for the regular, I would say, uh, secret services, we have a, an independent body which gives um, authorization, except in, in urgency, and they have to get it back uh, afterwards. And also uh, a posteriori control on the spot. And the transparency is made through their report, annual, the annual report of that independent body. And so we don't make a difference between uh, such or such services. I don't think it's a real good uh, thing uh, from the perspective of um, the collective um, uh, in, uh, public interest. 
we don't need to know how many from Google, how many from Twitter or something. But the whole thing, but right as you said, per type of uh, problem, huh? how, may, how much and by, by type of purposes. And maybe fr by uh, the origin of the request. And how much has been asked, how much has been authorized, and the kind of uh, reservation has been made. This kind of report exists in our country. Excuse uh, me, ma'am, I just because of there's so many people in the room who want to speak, do you mind if I cut you off there? Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I might just get a, a quick response on this question of anonymity uh, and real name policy, and because I think it's live, like we talked about it three years ago, we talked about it two years ago, it's being talked about here today. Um, many of the people who are working, living and working on the fringes of the open internet require anonymity or pseudonymity. There's a panel actually tomorrow or the day after on this specific issue, but let's just get a quick response. Why hasn't Facebook changed its position on this? So I, I don't think anyone at Facebook has ever said that there should uh, be no anonymity on the internet. Uh, and that's not our, and we've never advocated for removal of an anonymity on the internet. Um, what we, what we did was we created a service in which people use their real name. And even in that context, uh, uh, sure. sure. I've got to put the microphone up here. Uh, sorry. Uh, so we don't advocate for um, the remo removal of anonymity on the internet. Um, it's, it's never been our position. We created a service in which we asked people to use their real names uh, because we wanted to foster certain types of relationships. And, and that's, pr that's proven to be a very successful service. We've had lots of dialogue over the years as we've tried to figure out, well, like, how could we allow Facebook to be used for other purposes uh, without undermining the core real life uh, communications that we wanted to promote? So in the context of Facebook, we have kind of come up with some mechanisms for people to um, have a voice without it being, uh, coming back to them directly through the use of of pages, and, and we worked with a number of different groups on how you could set up an administrator for that page so that they could manage uh, communications without it, it coming back to an individual. Uh, when we get law enforcement requests related to uh, the administrators of pages, that's an area where we're particularly sensitive and always scrutinized to see if those are, are related to expression. Uh, and so. We, I th still, we recognize I did, I, there's a tension between yeah. uh, creating an, an anonymous communication platform and creating a real name platform, yeah. and, and so we chose to create a real name platform. Um, I mean, I, I don't see the questioner, the user, <laughs> very satisfied down there. Uh, but, um, so, so I don't know if there's either of you who would like to comment on either the, this issue before raised by a lady over there or on, on anonymity. I mean, I, I certainly can. Uh, I, I would say that for us, where, where Facebook very much went for the sort of real name, real world people you already know or know through others sort of interaction approach, Twitter has always, or at least from the beginning, was kind of built with this, you can follow who you choose to follow. It doesn't have to be in both directions. You choose your identity. It's, it's a different model and a different use case. And we certainly believe very strongly that for us, at least, identity is not inextricably linked with the name that you were born with. Your identity is what you choose it to be. That can be fluid. It may not be the same as it was yesterday or two weeks from now. And that's yeah. because you own that part of your identity. But there's, I think, different places for yeah. different services in this sort of hierarchy almost yeah. of, of use cases. I mean, I think this again comes back to this issue of terms of service. Like the company is deciding a question of rights because of their own internal business model or the, you know, the sort of perspectives of the investors or the owners or even the staff. Um, I want to actually raise a question which is not about policy but is actually about technology and for you, Joe, which is, and it's actually raised up here, it says, uh, Yahoo was unaware of the webcam spy program Optic Nerve 
that allowed the GCHQ to record, record 1.8 million users' private webcam chats? What prevents this exploit from being used on Google and Facebook? And we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, which is like, fire the lawyers and hire the engineers. Like, what is to stop, um, what is to stop governments from hacking into Facebook or Google or Twitter um, if the technology itself is not robust enough to repel them? I think that's a, a really good and really scary question. Um, I, I, I think the thing we've learned is that uh, they're not going to stop trying to do that. Um, and so there's probably a lot of anger inside the engineering teams and inside a lot of companies right now. Um, the, the, um, uh, we would like to suggest transparency would be ideal. I mentioned earlier, if governments had to be transparent about the number of accounts they were accessing, so if, if, if uh, GCHQ had put out a transparency report that said we accessed 1.8 million. This is billion. how many we hacked. <laughs> I mean, but, yeah, it's true. Like, we do obviously want transparency from, from government, but this is also the obligation, and back to this obligation question is like, how are you going to be one step ahead of those governments? And it's not just actually governments, it's also, it's also non-state actors, you know, employed groups that are actually um, recruited and contracted to hack the services. Particularly, I think, as Andrew McLaughlin talked about, this like transfer of data on fiber optic cables uh, across jurisdiction. So... Well, I, hopefully what we'll see is a lot more innovation uh, in the private sector around these types of issues. I, I was in the, um, uh, the downstairs, downstairs space during the last session listening to people debate different technologies and um, there's a lot more of that debate happening in a lot of different places right now than there was a little while ago. And I think that's a good thing. The more we develop uh, secure technologies that can be usable and implemented on, on larger platforms, the better. Yeah, and I mean, even in terms of like the shift to SSL on by default, for example, or the increasing number of companies that are implementing forward secrecy or perfect forward secrecy, like you're seeing continual innovation in terms of security components, not just at the level of, okay, how can I keep somebody from accessing my account? We all have two-factor, but also how can we make sure that, you know, nobody's seeing this who isn't meant to, like there's just, con it's, we're never going to be done. Yeah. We're never going to be able to say, okay, but, we're done with this. But what happened with Yahoo, and I'm not sure if Yahoo is in the room, but certainly um, they're at the conference. I mean, this is not innovation. This is just laziness, to my mind. Like, how is it possible that Yahoo would enable the government knowingly, I mean, they're in a position where their data is not encrypted and they don't have t uh, TLS by default, or perhaps they do now, but like, you know, how is it, how is the, um, is there Yahoo in the room, Abella? And if so, do you really want to identify yourself? <laughs> identify yourself, there's no anonymity here. Um, so, yeah. yeah. But I think, rather than looking backwards at what, what Yahoo did in the past, let's look at what can they do going forward and how can we all help each other get to that place? Uh -huh. I mean, we see that, you know, Yahoo's they just announced they're hiring a real, I think they announced they're hiring a really excellent head of security. Um, and they're going to keep investing in this area if they want to have a brand that's trusted. We're all going to keep investing as well. And there's a lot of good sharing of best practices. Uh, you know, people are contributing to OpenSSL. There's a lot of different ways that you can um, help us all get better. No, I think Joe is exactly right. What you, what you sort of did is say, oh my God, I can't believe that happened, but Yahoo was lazy because they, they let it happen. And I, under, I understand the anger and the argument, and it is up to the service providers to be many steps ahead. That's true. But, I, but some of the revelations that we've seen, I mean, were just basically astounding that people just, you know, when we found out that they were, the government was allegedly sort of tapping into communication between our data centers on a private network, I mean, was, uh, you know, we were horrified about the, re about the revelations. And, and we really have been, we feel at the forefront of encryption, you know, by default since 2010 on Gmail and search in 2011. And we felt like we were definitely staying a couple steps ahead. But that's what that points out is why the debate 
is that we're having now is so important more than anything else. Questions from the audience? Anyone else? Back there? Yep. In the back. And here, look up. Uh, yeah, I'm old enough to remember a lot of history. And it's just uh, so before you go on, if we can keep it nice and short as well, because there are a number of questions, not that I'm suggesting you're going to be a long time, but when you, you start all. talking about history, people start getting nervous. But I, <laughs> I think a big problem is complacency with individuals, not necessarily what the government does. And it was brought up earlier. Uh, years ago, to have the picture of the front and back of your house and everything would have been just unbelievable, available to anyone. Nowadays, are we going to have a camera on every street corner so uh, individuals say, oh yeah, it's good security, I can see who's going in front, or I want face recognition to identify people or cars. And when people become more complacent, then the uh, government and the private companies then will move in and say, well, we can sell this information or whatever. Am I going to be able to buy the emails from uh, um, another individual if someone at some future date says, hey, if you want to pay $50, we'll give you access to somebody's emails. Yeah, thank you. There's a question right up the back there. So, um, so I just uh, wanted to say that while we're talking about um, anonymity not needing to go away, that uh, Jillian York, who couldn't be here today, pulled up an article where it actually says Randy Zuckerberg from Facebook says online anonymity has to go away. So I think probably we need more on that. But really what I wanted to do is ask my question um, here, because okay. uh, we haven't gone back to the Slido, which is of how... Course. Yeah, are you going to do that no, later? No, please, go for it. Yeah. So how much training on human rights issues are you doing at your companies uh, for people who are not in your policy offices? How are you educating people about the conflicts with digital rights and technology? Yeah. Um, it seems like uh, uh, companies who really are committed to digital rights would make that uh, a part of everyday conversations. And, and what kind of human rights reviews do you do when you're developing new products? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a very pertinent question um, and it brings up that issue that I raised before about individuals who are within companies making decisions. There are standard, there are practices, human rights trainings, human rights diligence um, that are acknowledged and certified and I think that they're, again, coming back to this question of obligation, there really is an obligation. I mean, I don't know if people have, have, have read and maybe Joe Sullivan probably wishes this article from Forbes is not you know, the first thing that you see when you Google him. Um, but, you know, basically they say that Joe Sullivan is responsible for the security of a billion users. Um, and that makes him, in a way, more powerful and more important than the person who heads up the Department of Homeland Security. So, so, <laughs> so I'm paraphrasing, but I think that's basically what it says. But the question is, you, you have a team and you all have teams of people. What kind of information, what kind of training do you give particularly to the engineers who are more looking at you know, ones and zeros rather than policy positionings? Uh, we do quite a bit. Uh, we can always do more. Uh, it's something we've talked about a little bit in the past. Uh, I was, um, I guess it was two days ago, we had a, an event at our office where we brought in a bunch of, um, sorry, <laughs> I feel like I'm using the mic, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can hear myself well. Um, uh, the, uh, we do have a, a quite a bit of engagement uh, inside the company and, and not just with um, our policy teams, if you will. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Earlier this week, we had a, um, an event where we brought in a, a number of um, representatives from different organizations uh, and had the people who are um, launching different products at Facebook in the, in the near future and in the recent past and had them talk about what went into those products and, and get questions from those organizations. And 
it, it, it's really important to have that dialogue. I, I was on a call this morning where um, our chief privacy officer was talking about it, and she said, you know, the team that's launching that product that's coming up, they got some really good feedback. Um, the second example I'll give is uh, one of the teams that I manage is our team that handles all of the law enforcement data requests. And um, one of the things that you probably don't think about for the people in that job, but they have to um, stand in front of um, law enforcement officers who are used to never having anyone say no to them. And if you've looked at the transparency reports of all of our companies, you'll see that we're all saying no quite a bit because almost every request is overbroad and quite a few of them are illegal. And so we're, we all have to hire teams of people who are going through these requests with the magnifying glass and then they have to say no to this officer who's maybe his brother's the mayor or maybe um, this is their first online investigation and they're used to walking a beat in a community where, they, where everyone says, you know, stands up when they come walking down the street. And so we recognize that that, that team inside our company is constantly getting barraged with pressure from that one side. We have to have them um, calibrated. And so we have uh, different organizations come in um, and kind of present like and and tell us no you should be doing more uh, and um, it's if we didn't have that counterbalance it would it you know it would lead to you know uh, not the right approach i think yeah no it's, it's very much the same for us i mean when we we should be doing this but we and we do we devote an incredible amount of resources to to that task that joe just described it would be the easiest thing in the world for us to just roll over and say, all right, what do you want, and hand it over. But when you look at the transparency report that we produce, you recognize how rare that is. It takes a huge amount of resources to fight, and to, first of all, to take each and every request, examine it, and then fight back if it is overly broad or it is illegal. But we do that because we recognize we, we owe that to our users and we have that ob obligation and, to do and, so. And I think this is the question about digital due process, which is how do we ensure that the protections that are existing in the offline world uh, are brought into the online world and people know about the necessary and proportionate principles which set out exactly those steps. And I think what we are in the process, that where we are at the moment is this period of norm building, you know, which is not necessarily regulation, which I think the companies are definitely resistant to, but the creation of norms across companies and across the sector whereby information is not handed over unless there's a competent judicial authority that's issued a warrant. Information is not handed over unless there's some kind of connection between the purported offence um, and the surveillance that's used or that the law that's trying to address that, that issue. And so you know, this is part of it is about necessary and proportionate. The other part of it, which we've mentioned before, is about encrypt all the things, you know, which is sort of the policy and the technical side. And I think we need a duo. We need both of them working in kind of pincer. Um, did you, Dale, did you want to mention yeah, or respond? Yeah, I was going to just speak to the concept of, of training and, you know, how you raise awareness in the folks who are not necessarily dealing with these kinds of issues on a, on a daily basis, because that's actually something that we're super conscious of. You know, most folks who are working in product or engineering are approaching things from the mindset of, you know, I built this awesome, amazing thing. It's going to let people do wonderful things. And you say, well, you know, somebody could also use it to do this bad thing. And they're like, well, why? And then you have to be like, no, some, but somebody will. Like, somebody will use to do the bad thing. Like, let's explain to you why we have to build in protections kind of from the ground up. And, you know, one of the, one of the strategies that we've actually employed to try to get folks across the company thinking about that is, you know, every PM at Twitter who's launching features, whether they be internal, external, whatever, is actually assigned a representative from trust and safety who will attend their stakeholder meetings from start to finish and just give input throughout like, hey, make sure that you're thinking about X, make sure you're thinking about Y. Did you realize that this could also be used for Z? Because it's really, really challenging for the folks who are building and developing things that they're you know, imagining are going to be, there's just this inherent cognitive dissonance to stopping and going, and how will all of this also go horribly wrong? So I'm hearing, seeing a lot of nodding between the three of you on various things. Have you guys met before? 
Uh, we've never met. No. Neither of us have met Ross. Okay. We aren't entirely sure if he's, you know, even so, an well, actor. I'm the reason, we don't know what's happening. But, <laughs> the reason but why Joe I, and I are besties, so okay. it's good. De Del and I were at a, um, a working session on suicide prevention uh, a couple yeah. of weeks ago. Uh, uh, this is uh, my we, question, really, yeah, is we, like how much, how much time... And Ross, maybe this is your bad that you should be spending more time with these guys. But like, well, we're see, trying I'm, to. He I'm, doesn't call. I'm, he doesn't, I'm he doesn't call. He doesn't read. I'm, I'm one of those horrible lawyers that you were talking about right. earlier, policy but, side. But, but these but guys really build this stuff. And but what we're talking about is like, like a race to the top. And I think what users us have a concern with is that there has been a race to the bottom, certainly in terms of government actions and potentially in corporate actions as well. And so this kind of exchange, and it's great that it's happening here on stage, and it's, but. It would be really, really good, and there are bodies like the GNI, for instance, um, and other coalitions where there is an opportunity. But I think that certainly myself and probably members of the audience would be happy to know that you guys are working out what is best policy if in, the, in the absence of regulation, what is the best practice. Uh, well, don't take the fact that I haven't met Dell or Joe I've before as an indication. Of his I mean, this stuff. just because I'm not involved in sort of those engineering technical conversations doesn't mean that they aren't happening because I know for a fact they are. And you mentioned the GNI, which is a place where a lot of those conversations also happen. Um, and uh, an earlier question was talking about this this issue of how do we ensure that you know companies are working together and, and doing the right thing. And GNI is actually a locus where those conversations are happening every day. So I think we should switch gears for a sec. I want to talk about, um, and hopefully you want to talk about as well, the issue of governance, the issue of internet governance. I think many of some people here certainly know that there's a battle for governance of the internet that is taking place uh, in every international forum that I know of. It doesn't matter whether it's the General Assembly, the ITU, um, ICANN, uh, it's, it's, it's real. Uh, and, and in fact, um, maybe uh, Ambassador Adonho is here. Um, she sat on the Human Rights Council for three years and she said that I sat through the discussions and advocated on the discussions on, on Syria, on North Korea, um, on on um, you know every protracted battle that you could imagine, uh, but she said the hardest fight and the most fractious uh, disagreements in the Human Rights Council were over the future of the internet. And she said, and you know why? Because who controls the internet controls the future of the world, and that battle is actually taking place right now. And I wonder. You know, we saw what happened with the World Conference on International Telecommunications, Wicket, at the end of 2012. We have a whole series of events that are taking place this year. Um, maybe we could hear from you in terms of what you think is likely to happen uh, on governance and you could perhaps um, reflect upon the, the kind of perceived and real um, control over ICANN as well and whether there needs to be some interna internationalization of that body. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, we, um, so that I lead the team that focuses on internet governance at Google. And as you know, Brett, we were very, um, very engaged at, in Dubai at, at Wicket. And we were engaged far before then. And we continue to stay engaged because we share the concern that you just articulated. We've got a conference in Sao Paulo at the end of April, uh, which is being hosted by the Brazilian government. Um, and then we're slowly finding out more information about what that conference looks like, what the outcomes will be. Um, and it's sort of a precursor to um, what I would say is a much more dangerous conference in Busan uh, held by the ITU, at which the ITU will rewrite its constitution. And there will definitely be a push by uh, factors within the ITU and by many governments there to put the internet and internet regulation firmly in its constitution, which we think would be a horrible idea. Um, so we're engaged on all fronts. We're working with civil society. We're directly lobbying governments who uh, share our concern about the future of the internet and internet governance. Uh, we're drafting submissions right now that we're gonna be finalizing for the Brazil conference. Um, but I agree with you that the, that the threat is real. And the danger is that what you'll have is this call it an unholy alliance of 
countries like Russia and Syria and China and Iran who don't like the way that the net is currently run through the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, and they will, they will use the ITU as the vehicle for changing that model, for increasing government regulation. Just to push back a little, I think some people feel as though multi-stakeholderism as a term is really just a disguise for US company and US government maintaining its control over the internet. And that in fact, other forms of governance are um, distributed amongst all nations and that the ICANN relationship with the US government uh, and the dominance of US companies um, is something that you guys like just fine. And so, of course you'd be scared and, and see it as a dangerous activity um, with, within the ITU. Sure. Well, we are supportive of, the, of ICANN moving to a model where it is uh, a global model and not just U.S. corporation with U.S. Function, with functions here. Um, and we think that's, that's a good thing. But a lot of the folks making the argument that you just made are actually um, the same folks who are, you know, who are using the NSA revelations and using that as... As, as, as a starting point for having this discussion about taking control of the internet away. Let's, let's turn to the crowd. Yep, Luca. <clears throat> Morning, Luca Belli. I work at the Paris University. I'm the founder of the Dynamic Coalition on Network Neutrality of the United Nations Internet Governance Forum and I'm serving as a natural neutrality expert for the Council of Europe. So now that I introduce myself, uh, uh, just a quick comment and a proposal. Uh, the comment is, uh, I think everyone uh, has understood that uh, terms of service of platforms uh, have more, more or less the same capability to shape uh, users' rights that the law of the land has, because they can limit fundamental rights, they can extend them. But the, the problem is that the law of the land is uh, framed by a constitutional, constitutional framework, is reviewed, there are some checks and balances, and the uh, private regulation of the terms of services, it is not framed by any constitutional framework. So if you have law of the land versus law of the cloud, the law of the cloud is not framed and is ex essentially private. So the proposal is, uh, would you uh, engage in a collaboratory effort to uh, create some model provisions that uh, can uh, protect human rights and with a framework that can be associated with some sort of uh, rule of law or, or due process mechanism that can be applied? Would you uh, engage in such a collaboratory effort? And uh, I look forward to hear your answer. I, 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 I want to address this view that somehow companies are not subject to the law and it's just not the case. The terms of services that we have, our entire operations are subject to the law. And I think, um, I think there's this sense, and I think sometimes I think about the blame that internet companies bear for this, that there's always been this talk about this digital exceptionalism, right? That pff, your laws don't apply to us, we're going to go off and do what we want, and that's just not true. So I, I don't think it's really helpful to talk about terms of service on this level of, well, they're actually more powerful than the law. Mm. Uh, they aren't. Our, our terms of service do not trump the U.S. Constitution. Our terms of service do not trump U.S. law. I mean, what we, what we talk about, of course, is that we're global companies, and so we're subject to various sets of laws and various jurisdictions all around the world, and that's actually one of the reasons why, when we propose the principles for reform, we address that very fact, that there are conflicting jurisdictions and conflicting legal models that apply, and we're, we're asking for some sense of sanity, for some sense of, you know, mostly through MLAT reform, but, um, you know, I, I just want to dispel this myth that somehow we operate in the heavens and and we aren't subject to any of this stuff. Yeah, sorry, maybe I wasn't speaking my mind clearly. I wasn't okay. saying that the terms of no, service. I kind of took it sideways, so okay. I apologize. Okay. And, and yeah. your question was, would, yeah. would we? No, no. My question, my okay, my comment was knowing that mecha private mechanism are not reviewed. Let's say at Facebook, if I publish some obscene material, it will be taken down. But uh, I will not have a mechanism that grant me a review of this operation because 
uh, you know, if it is a, a private mechanism or a self uh, self enforcing mechanism, you cannot uh, oppose to some other body uh, the, the decision. You cannot uh, you could, you do not have a recourse. Okay. So what I was proposing was, uh, would you engage in a, an effort to create such a mechanism? I'm not saying that you are not uh, uh, ruled by national legislation. I'm just saying that it could be a great example from uh, such important platforms that have such an influence on a transnational level to engage in an effort to be uh, subject to a, to a self uh, in a self-regulation mechanism of rule of law and due process, if you want to see it that way. You know, I, I think that we all, um, as our companies uh, mature and, and we have people using our service from all over the world, we realize that uh, the legal standards and cultural expectations are different in different countries. And we can't have a, um, we can't have a belief that because you know, our employees grew up in one country, that that is a standard that should apply everywhere to every context. We try and work um, and understand different cultures and communities so that we can respect those, uh, not just on the legal standard, but on, on other cultural standards as well. But it's certainly a challenge that every, uh, anyone who creates a product, as that product goes out into the world, has to deal with, um, whether it's hardware or software or anything else. Yeah, just, just before Dell responds, I mean, I think that's true. This conference, however, is about human rights and technology. And what we would argue, and certainly the International Human Rights Framework, it talks about and has been accepted that this is universal and that it is not subject to local law or cultural boundaries. I mean, this is really about the right to privacy is the right to privacy, as we put up on the screen before. The right to seek, receive, and impart information is enshrined, um, not just in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but in all of the regional human rights treaties. Um, so, so this does kind of pose a question, and again, it's also about jurisdiction as well, but how do we ensure the primacy of the international human rights framework across all of those 195 jurisdictions in which you operate. Yeah. Well, I was actually just going to say that I, I could have been wrong, but I think part of the question was also just shouldn't users have a way to appeal if something happened and they didn't like the outcome, right? In normal law, you can say, well, I'm going to take this to the next court up and ask for their judgment on this because I think you were wrong. And I think all of us have an appeals process for, you know, you were suspended because we received, you know, X number of DMCA notifications and you didn't file counter DMCAs for any of them. And at this point, your account is suspended. Like, you can write in as a user and say, hey, I don't understand what happened. I think that the challenge for all of our companies is to make that process as clear to the user, both perhaps the one that's reporting what they find problematic and then the user who has their content reported. Just making it really clear to both parties what's happening, why it's happening, what their options are, and why their options are what they are. I think that's something that we have made some strides on, but we have to keep working on. And I think that that also is something where being aware of cultural norms within different communities is actually really important to take into consideration because even just verbiage or even just the way that we might say something in country, in this country, would just have a completely different effect in another country if we did a literal translation. So. Yeah. But we're also talking about remedy now as well because the RUGI framework, which I think many people in the room know about, um, was, is very clear that there's respect, protect, um, protect, respect, and remedy. And that companies are both, um, their duty actually goes to that third leg as well, which is not just about having a complaint mechanism or review mechanism, but is actually about making good on human rights abuses or human rights violations that take place because of that service. And this, when we talk about law, I mean, this is now established international law. Um, so I think it's the next step and the telecom sector is also starting to think about how do we employ remedy? Um, 
and some of it is about companies actually um, making good upon th those impacts, those human rights impacts, and part of it is about judicial remedy as well, of course. Um, so I'm not sure how much more time um, we have. I have a question up, uh, and a series of questions up the back. Let's get uh, a question here and one from there, and then we might need to wrap um, so that we can have a cup of coffee before the next, before the next session. Hi, I'm Kavitha from the Committee to Protect Journalists, and I wanted to follow up on what Dell was asking about um, the, the right to review when decisions are made, and there's been a lot of concern from journalists and human rights activists about Facebook's takedown of some pages related to the Syrian conflict, and I just wondered if Joe could take us through the process for reviewing those takedowns, and when there is reason to appeal, how do people even go about that? And what's the status of, um, of the controversy right now? Like, wh where do things stand with those pages? I haven't been involved in the specific pages, so I'm not sure of any of the details of the um, specific case. Um, but if we could meet afterwards, if you could give me that information, I could follow up on it. I think we're all, we all, all always want to get to the right answer. Um, uh, over the years working at Facebook, I've, I've found that we are frequently criticized both by people on both sides of every issue uh, for censorship. And I can, I can honestly say we're not trying to censor anyone. Our goal is, and our mission as a company is, is to create a platform where people, you know, people can connect and communicate openly. And so we don't, we, we don't want to take a view on, on any issue. We want to be a neutral platform where people can communicate. Um, we sometimes do mista make mistakes when we remove items. Uh, the more controversial something is, the more times it gets reported, for sure. And um, we, what we do to try and, and get the answer right is we try and hire people who are um, grounded in the different cultures around the world, who are native language speakers, who can evaluate the content from, from the right perspective and understand it. Um, and, um, and so we mostly get it right, but sometimes we get it wrong. Uh, and then if it's a high enough profile thing, it certainly gets uh, written about, but we do have appeal mechanisms uh, built into our service so that the person who, is, who has their account disabled can write into us directly as well. Hi, uh, my name is Jabu, I'm from South Africa. Um, I do LGBTI media reporting in the continent. Um, I'm really concerned about uh, the use of the words like traditional or cultures in contexts, especially in the continent where homosexuality is becoming more and more criminalized. We're looking at Uganda, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Zambia. I mean, I can go on and on. Um, Facebook is often a platform for us to use uh, to express concerns of vulnerability. I'm wondering to what extent do you gather that data in order to advance human rights at all. Do you do that? Um, I also want to know specifically around uh, why do you choose to use facial recognition software on your, on, on, you know, with photographs? And lastly, I had a question earlier about WhatsApp. You bought the app. Are you going to be doing any codifying encryptions? It, I believe it's unencrypted. Um, it's a platform that most people use because of its affordability. Um, so I'd like to know about the securities on that. Sure. Okay. I, I, I'll take them in reverse order if I or might have to ask you. Okay. All right, I'll start at the beginning. Um, we have not aggregated, inf we don't try and aggregate information in the manner that I think you were asking about. Um, and when we talk about um, respecting cultures, I'm, I'm thinking about in terms of the way we communicate and understanding local standards, not um, supporting some kind of repression. Uh, so I'm sorry if I gave that misperception. Mis um, With regard to WhatsApp, uh, the lawyers would say that that, that transaction hasn't completed, and so uh, WhatsApp is still an independent company, and we're not allowed to um, engage directly with them on their security practices. Um, I think that 
uh, as a as a bystander, I've seen that there's been a, a lot of um, lack of understanding of the encryption practices that they do have in place, and I think that some of the stories have been corrected in the last week or so, and that they um, that they that they do have um, a certain level of, of of cryptography in place and and use SSL. I I can say that when uh, they do hopefully become part of the Facebook family, uh, we will uh, be excited to work with them on their security practices and keep moving them forward. So I, I might just um, finish up by asking a final question. We started with the Dalai Lama, a uh, question about compassion, and I wanted to ask you a question about, um, you know, this, the title of this panel is about um, digital rights and how do we ensure these platforms respect digital rights. If you were to pick one principle or one concept, what would be the guiding principle or concept that you would like to see your company employ in respecting the digital rights of your 1.5, 1.8 billion users collectively around the world? Uh, can, I, can I have two? Yeah. Okay. can have two. I think, I think the key Matt is saying, no, I can't have two. Uh, um, I, think, I think what we remain focused on is giving users control, giving them the information, the transparency element, and then giving them control over their, how they interact with us, the data they give us, and how that's used. So it's really two things. I think we need to keep um, being open, uh, open to feedback uh, in particular. I didn't come to this event today because I was trying to convince anyone about anything about Facebook. I, I signed up for this conference because I, I, wanted to, I wanted to hear the hard questions that people were going to ask. And I want to have dialogue with people here about what, you know, what they're disappointed in us for. I, I, I want us to be open to your feedback. And I want us to keep coming to these events. I want you to keep putting on these events and keep inviting us uh, so that we can uh, continue to learn um, and, and continue to get better. So you'll be pleased to know that there's a number of roundtables that are taking place between each of these guys and a room full of activists who are working and living on the front lines. And if people would like to attend any of those, please come and talk to me. Um, lastly, from Del, from, from Twitter. I would obviously echo the transparency concept as a whole and control. The other component that I would perhaps underscore for us is rather than a, a right for our users is a responsibility that we have as companies and that's to never ever think that we have done as well as we can. We can't ever say, okay, well, this is done and we, are, we don't have to look at this process again or we don't have to look at this control again or we don't have to look like, all right, that's all sorted for forever, right? Because yeah. if we aren't consistently pushing ourselves to get better, whether it's about notifying users about something or transparency and granularity or even just, you know, how users understand and interact with our platform, then we're inevitably going to miss things at an even faster rate than we might now because there's just so much happening that we can never assume that we're done with anything. And I think Mitchell Baker's comments earlier this morning where she said, like, we've come a long way, actually, since we were in 2011. The dialogue that is happening here is far more mature and far more considered and nuanced than it was in, in our first conference. So there is a huge way to go still, and I think that the sand is moving underneath us all the time. Um, the respect for user rights is the topic of this conference and of this panel, and I'd like you to join me in thanking um, Ross from Google, Joe from Facebook, and Dell from Twitter.